Hello, and welcome to the global premiere of Cornwall's Climate Stories Under the Surface. My name is Dawn Bay, and I'm a trustee of the new charity, Cornwall Climate Care, which produced the amazing film you're about to see. It's really great to see so many people here tonight. We have over a thousand people registered, which is amazing. People are tuning in from all over Cornwall, but we also have people tuning in from much further afield, Plymouth, Scotland, America, Australia and beyond. So welcome to all of you. We'd actually like to really like to hear from all of the, those of you who are not in Cornwall. So as a little experiment, hopefully you can see on your screen the chat box on YouTube. So do put in the chat box where you're watching from and we'd love to say hello. So have a go at that and, we, and we'll say hello to you. So you are in for a real treat tonight, a high quality film that's not just beautiful and fascinating, it's thought provoking and designed to make you think and even better, act. In a few minutes, I'll take you through the running order for the evening, introduce you to the makers of the film and explain how you can get involved tonight. But before I do, I just want to say a few words about the context for this important film. You may have noticed in the last few months, we're in a global pandemic and it's been hard. Tens of thousands of people who have tragically died. People have lost their livelihoods and their homes. And even at the e easiest end of the scale, it's been tough. It's been lonely, boring, difficult to adapt. But, while the media is packed with wall-to-wall -wall COVID coverage, full of shrill headlines about how we're all doomed unless we get vaccinated, there's an even bigger emergency going on. Something that is much more serious, much more dangerous, and ultimately poses an ex existential threat to all of us as a human race. Climate emergency. The impact of what we are doing to ourselves to our beautiful, precious earth and its natural resources. I don't know about you, but sometimes I find it really hard to get my head around the idea of climate emergency. The scientists that say it's not just 10 seconds to midnight, it's just 100 seconds to midnight for planet Earth. It's easier for me to think that climate change is something that's happening over there. It's for polar bears on ice caps. It's a big plastic rubbish heap in the middle of the Pacific Ocean somewhere. That's why climate, Cornwall Climate Care, a new charity has been set up to change the way we think about climate change. Cornwall Climate Care wants to show this isn't just something happening in the Arctic or islands in the Pacific, it's happening right here where we live. Climate change is local, it's personal, and it's happening right now here in Cornwall on our shores, in our seas and fields and in our communities. In a minute, I'm going to introduce you to the charity's founder and producer, Claire Wallerstein, who many of you will know, and director, Bryony Stokes. Claire is probably best known locally for her environmental campaigns against plastic in the ocean with Rain Peninsula Beach Care. But she's also a journalist, author, and was a press officer for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Bryony is an experienced environmental documentary photo videographer. She's made over 600 online films specialising in environmental topics. Bryony lives on an old wooden fishing trawler and says filming and living afloat in Cornwall for over a decade gives her a unique porthole view into the changing climate around our coastline. We're going to hear from Claire and Bryony in a minute as they introduce the film. Then we'll show the film, which will take about 30 minutes. And then it's time for you to get involved. We'll move on to a Q&A session. We're really pleased to have with us most of the experts who you're going to see talking in the film. And also Councillor Edwina Hannaford, Cornwall Council Portfolio Holder for Climate Change and Communities. We'll aim to finish around about nine or slightly later if it's lively. In the meantime, if you have any comments or questions during or after the film, please put them in the chat box on YouTube for the Q&A. I'm now going to hand over to Claire and Bryony to introduce the film. Claire. 
Sorry, already going wrong, not unmuting myself. Um, thank you, Dawn. And uh, thanks so much to everybody who's tuned in um, tonight. It's, I'm, I'm completely mind boggled by the number of, uh, number of you that have come along. Um, and I hope you're really going to enjoy it. As Dawn said, um, what we want to do really is to try and change the way that we talk about climate change. Um, we feel that too often it's been presented as something that's a problem for other parts of the world or far off in the future. It's this kind of slow moving problem. Um, which kind of feels overwhelming and scary, but also sort of unreal. Um, and you might also even feel that we're getting on top of it because our government has set targets for us to get to carbon neutral by 2050. And Cornwall Council is even more ambitious. It wants us to get there by 2030. Um, targets are great, but what do they really mean? If we're going to get there, that's going to mean cutting our emissions every single year by the same amount that they've fallen during COVID. And that's a huge challenge. It can be done, but to get there, we're going to really all need to start acting now and everyone needs to be on board. And the problem is they're not. As we all know, there's lots of misinformation out there about climate change. There are people who don't believe in it, don't understand, or maybe they don't even care. And many people can't afford to do anything about it because they're just struggling to get from one day to the next. And obviously um, after what we've all been through this past year, many more people fall into that bracket. So for us, a big part of this film project is about reaching those people who are unengaged um, by showing that this is all about us right here where we live. The film we're going to show you tonight is an environmental film, but we're not only going to be telling environmental stories because we can't just talk about trees and whales and butterflies. Not everybody cares about those things and we need to talk about things that everybody will relate to. So we're going to be making films about how climate change is going to affect our housing or our health, our food and energy. And we're also very keen to steer away from a kind of doom and gloom narrative because that really turns people off. So we're presenting the facts, but we're also focusing very much on the positives because we want to motivate and engage people. And we have got so many exciting and pioneering technological developments happening right here in Cornwall that most people don't know anything about. We've got the world's first electric ferry being built here. We've got the geothermal energy um, being, being exploited down in the granite lands. We're making green fuel from cattle slurry, all sorts of really cutting edge things. But we also really want to tell the stories of regular communities and individuals who are doing so much to restore nature, whether that's reintroducing beavers to help prevent flooding or restoring the peatlands on our moors or farming in more nature friendly ways. Because the real point is this isn't just a climate crisis that we're in. It's an ecological crisis, too. And we need healthy habitats and ecosystems to protect us from the challenges that climate change is going to bring. Lastly, we're also focusing our work on young people, because these are the people whose lives are going to be overshadowed by the cha challenges that are coming and the impacts of climate change. Yeah. But the problem is that teaching about climate change in our schools is still very limited. Um, the, the charity Teach the Future has recently run a survey which found that only 4% of school students felt that they knew a lot about climate change and 75% of teachers said that they felt they'd had inadequate training to be able to teach children about it. So this is why we're really hoping to get our films into all the secondary schools and colleges throughout Cornwall. And we're working with a team of teachers to produce educational resources that can be used with the films as, uh, to, to provide lessons across the curriculum. So not just in science and geography where, where children are learning about climate change now, but in other subjects like English and PSHE and business studies. Um, Brian and I are both parents ourselves, and I'm sure very many of you watching tonight are too. And of course, nobody wants to paralyze young people with fear and eco-anxiety, but our young people do need to be emotionally and practically prepared for the challenges of a different world and also the jobs and innovation that will come with the green economy. So personally, I started doing this because I was worried about my children's future. I am still worried, but now I feel more hopeful because I've been so inspired by the amazing people we've met all over Cornwall who are working on different aspects of this massive challenge. And we've really only just begun. Um, we definitely don't have all the answers and we're not promising to give you all the answers in our films, but we do hope that we can start conversations. And we're really excited about bringing you all the next episodes in this series over the coming months and years. And now I'd just like to hand over to Bryony. 
Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to watch the first of Cornwall's climate stories, Under the Surface. Um, it's a 30-minute long documentary that was actually pitched to be a 10-minute series of films, but there were just so many stories to tell and too little time to tell it in. Um, I'd just like to say at this point, thank you to Amanda Tunison for her help on the script editing, or this would have actually been two hours. Um, it's the first in a series. The first one is narrated by Claire, the producer who we just met, um, as the story was hers. But the following films will be narrated by a different local person with experiences in the topic. We have some really exciting ideas for narrators for the next few films. But if you have a climate, co co climate story to tell, then please do get in touch with us. Um, we want to give a voice to people's real lived experiences so we can see real climate action instead of people just talking about it. Um, I hope that it's going to help us all feel the need to get involved. Films should inspire, so it is time to tell the stories of the people who are just getting on and doing it. Different musician for each film, this one that you're about to see tonight, all the tracks are from the amazingly talented Simon Dobson. Um, it's all been filmed in Cornwall, obviously. Um, Cornwall is a great place to make these films as there is so much going on. Being on the coastal fringes, we may be the first to experience some of these changes, but we can also be an example for people all over the world in our response. So um, we'd also love to hear from you on whether this film achieves any of these things. It is the first one that we have edited, although we have started filming some of the others. Um, but please do send us your comments as well as questions for our panellists. So, without further ado, I'd love to play the film. I hope you enjoy it. This is what defines Cornwall. We rely on the sea for tourism and sport, for fishing, transport and fun. But beneath that glittering surface, some big changes are starting to happen. I'm Claire Wallerstein, and this is my climate story. I've spent the past eight years running beach cleans near my home in South East Cornwall and campaigning to tackle plastic pollution. Volunteer groups like ours all around Cornwall have worked hard for years and removed hundreds of tonnes of plastic from our shores. It feels like the message has really been getting through. Most people don't have to think twice about what is the biggest threat to life in the sea. Loads of people just throw away stuff. Plastic. Plastic. It has to be the amount of plastics that's being discharged. First thing comes to mind is plastic. But marine experts aren't so sure. The focus on marine plastics in the last 10 years has been really important, but actually I worry we're now at a point that it's perhaps distracting to some of the other large environmental challenges we face, such as climate change. Climate change is happening. I know there are disbelievers, but it's, it is happening. And unless we do something very rapidly, we are going to see really serious consequences in the next 10 to 20 years. The thing to be most worried about is temperature change in the ocean at the rate that we're seeing it. Definitely. Climate change in the marine environment usually conjures up images of things far away from home, like polar bears, melting ice caps and bleached coral reefs. But I wanted to find out if it's such a big problem in Cornwall, so I met up with scientist Matthew Witt, whose job involves satellite tagging some of the incredible marine species that visit Cornwall, including leatherback turtles, bluefin tuna and basking sharks. In the old records, this would be a, like a relatively good density hotspot for basking sharks, but not anymore. A basking shark is a plankton-eating shark. There's, there's only a few plankton-eating sharks. The other one is the mega mouth and the really well-known whale shark. They can grow up to 10 metres long. They produce few young and every few years. And the period over which that young shark develops inside the female is probably up to something like two years. Since 2012, we've tagged 90 sharks and they've made some fantastic movements from Scotland all the way down to Morocco. 
and to the Madeira and the Canary Islands. But in more recent years, the numbers reported off our coast have plummeted. Public sightings of basking sharks reported to the Cornwall Wildlife Trust fell from over 200 in 2006 to just six in 2019. Understanding how the population might be changing is actually really quite challenging because unlike dolphins and porpoises, they're not obliged to come to the surface to breathe. So counting them is really very hard. There are still many unknowns about what's driving the shark's decline, but one likely reason is changes to their food source. Basking sharks are a bit like blue whales. They're some of the largest animals in the world and they sustain themselves on some of the smallest. So when plankton changes, we think so do the behaviours of basking sharks. The shark's food source is changing and plankton analyst Marianne Wooten is worried. When we look out there, the beautiful environment that we've got here, the sea, most people don't stop to think about all the billions of organisms that are in the sea. They might think about fish, mammals, um, seals, dolphins, whatnot, but who really actually holds up a jar of seawater and thinks, oh yeah, there's plankton in there? It's kind of not on our radar, really. There's thousands of organisms that form plankton. We can separate them into two distinct groups. We've got the phytoplankton, the plant plankton, and just like plants on Earth, they're important because they release oxygen into the atmosphere. So up to about 50% of the net oxygen that's around us now, is produced by the phytoplankton, the plant plankton. So that means that every other breath is a plankton breath. And then we have these animal plankton. They're also important because, of course, these guys form the food for other animals higher up in the trophic chain. So we've got small fish feeding on them. Some seabirds feed directly on plankton. And then we have these amazing baleen whales, of course, that they feed directly on plankton too. But you don't have to feed directly on plankton for plankton to be important to you in the sea. Most animals, their life is dependent on plankton at some point in their life history. Plankton are an amazingly important part of the food web. Without plankton, the oceans would be barren. We'd have less oxygen in the atmosphere. But crucially, all of these, these thousands, billions of plankton that are in the ocean, what happens to them when they die? Well, they rain down, they settle down, and they become part of the sediment and they lock away carbon. Marianne works for the Continuous Plankton Recorder, which has been running for nearly 90 years. It's the longest running and most geographically extensive survey of its kind anywhere in the world. So far it's sampled more than 7 million miles of ocean and it's been detecting some disturbing shifts in plankton populations. The warmer species are moving gradually further further north. And the colder water species are retreating further and further north. And that distance is about 10 degrees latitude in the last 50 years. And that's in response, direct response, to sea surface temperatures induced by climate change. Not so long ago, the Cornish coast was the stronghold for a species of cold water plankton that was an incredibly important part of the marine food chain. But now, a different species is moving in, spelling major changes for the fish we eat and all other life in our seas. There's two copepods in particular that we find around the coast here that are really quite important for fish in particular, larval fish, and all sorts of other organisms. The cold water copepods now disappeared. This warmer water one has moved in there. You might think, okay, well, one's moved out, another one's moved in. Everything's all right still, isn't it? It's always more complex than that. Although a warmer water one's moved in, its seasonal peak is a different place in time, and it's nowhere near as abundant, nowhere near. So that means now larval fish that come along, that have always come along for hundreds of years and expect there to be food around, well now there's just not as much food around. This mismatch between the times when plankton is around and when the animals actually need to eat it is already having dramatic effects, as ornithologist Mark Grantham explained to me. These cliff areas are a bit of a scarcity these days. If you go back even just 20, 25 years, we would have had a dozen kittiwake nesting sites like this dotted around Cornwall. Since then, we're now down to five. Kittiwake is Britain's commonest gull, but we don't think it is because they're either nesting on inaccessible cliffs or in the winter they're spending their time out at sea. They're the most pelagic of gulls, they're the most seafaring of gulls, and really that's what drives their decline from a climate change point of view is that 
the sea, especially in the southern edge of the range, is just gradually warming, and you're talking half a degree a decade. If you look at the much bigger scale, Kittuake is now extinct in Spain. Kittuake is now extinct in the Channel Islands. It's extinct in southern France. If you look along the south coast of Britain, so between Kent and the Scillies, we've lost 60% of our colonies in the last 20 years. So it's not sustainable. To be a successful Kittuake colony, you need to be producing between 1.2, 1.5 chicks per pair. Here, we don't make one. Kitty wakes feed on small larval fish and sand eels, which in turn feed on plankton. But as our waters warm, this food source is being disrupted. And basically, the food that these birds need just isn't there. So they become food stressed, and when you're food stressed, you're less likely to breed. If kitty wakes are doing badly, then it's a real indicator that everything else in the food chain below it is doing badly. Seabirds are the easiest indicator to look at as to the state of the ocean. They are very long-lived birds, so it is hard to keep track of how big the decline might be. I mean, we can count the birds, we can count colonies, we can count the number of birds in those colonies, but what we don't know is when those numbers go down, are those birds moving elsewhere? Are they dying or are they just being pushed further north? But eventually you just run out of places to go. There's only so far north you can go before you run out of places to nest. It's shocking to learn just how much our seas are already changing and without most of us even having noticed. But the sea could be our biggest ally in helping to cushion the impact of climate change. And with almost 400 miles of coastline, Cornwall could pave the way in protecting the marine ecosystems that we'll need to protect us in future. Nature has got an incredible power to heal itself if we let it have the space to do that. And the sea is an ideal example of that. We don't need to actively manage the sea for those habitats to come back and restore and become wildlife rich again. We need to start looking at the sea as both a solution for the current ecological crisis, but also the climate crisis. It's hoped Cornwall could soon pilot an ambitious national scheme called Highly Protected Marine Areas, where all damaging human activity and fishing would be banned. Fishermen may not like this idea, but their concerns could turn out to be unfounded if what has happened around the tiny Devon island of Lundy is anything to go by. Lundy's the only real total marine nature reserve that we've got at the moment. The impacts and the recovery of the wildlife, and particularly scallops and lobsters in that marine reserve, boomed. So the numbers within the reserve have got bigger, the actual animals themselves have got bigger, and as a consequence, they're spilling over into the wider area around Lundy and improving the local fisheries. So while there's initial impact in the fisheries are excluded from that small area, over the course of the long term, and we're talking sort of five to 10 years, they're seeing the benefits now. The aim of the HPMAs would be to let large areas around UK coasts recover as whole and healthy ecosystems. Some of these underwater habitats can store much more carbon than trees on land, so they'll play a really important role in helping us to limit global heating. Our merl beds, which is calcified seaweed, really important carbon habitat. Our kelp beds and seaweeds are really valuable in storing carbon. And then further offshore, we have huge areas of deep sea sediment and muds. And whilst they don't look very much, deep sea mud can store five times more carbon than upland peat. We've got really valuable tidal ecosystems with areas of salt marsh that are incredibly carbon rich. That habitat can store this, this carbon for, for long periods of time. We've got a history of draining those habitats over the recent centuries. And what we now need to do is get rid of that mindset. We allow the sea to come back into those areas and the salt marsh to flourish and thrive again. We're not only building our biodiversity in those areas, but also storing much more carbon. In Cornwall, we have got a massive resource and we really want to get this moving quickly. So we're at the process of shortlisting potential inshore sites, which would be really valuable for communities, but also offshore sites where just taking away some of the fishing activity could have massive positive consequences for climate action and carbon sequestration. Ruth hopes the first trial highly protected marine areas could get off the ground within the next year. But elsewhere in Cornwall, people are looking at other ways of harnessing the carbon storage potential of our underwater forests. They contain more minerals, more vitamins than any other food group. 
they have antiviral, antibacterial, anti carcinogenic properties even. They can be used for antibiotics. They're just incredible. You can make everything out of it that is now produced by oil. It can solve the world's problems. The Cornish Seaweed Company harvests some of the 650 species of seaweed from around the lizard. Sales are doubling every year, so Tim's company has embarked on England's first ever project to farm sugar kelp. We started the project three years ago with basically zero knowledge of any farming and farming seaweed in Europe is a very new thing still. So we didn't know what to expect and the first year we tried, we did everything wrong that we could have done wrong. So we didn't grow a single seaweed, <laughs> which was almost encouraging really, because you want to make those mistakes when you start up and when everything is still small. After these teething problems, the company is now growing several tons of sugar kelp on ropes at a floating mussel farm. Right now, it's all about food, but because kelp grows so fast, there could be an interesting side benefit in helping to suck up carbon. There's definitely a lot more potential to store carbon in the sea compared to the land. To start with, trees take years to grow and actually start absorbing carbon, not until like 20 years or something, and that's too late. Whilst if you do seaweed, in six months it grows two metres long. Immediately you can start absorbing carbon. And there's just so much more space. One of the things that you can do is taking the sugar kelp and burying it in the deep sea where it will stay there for a long time, meaning that you can bury the carbon. It's not something that we're working on at the moment, but it's something we're definitely looking into. Seaweed could help us to fight climate change in an even more surprising way too. We have over 300,000 cows in Cornwall, and each time they burp they release methane, a greenhouse gas that's tens of times more potent than carbon dioxide. One of the ways seaweeds can be beneficial to the climate is to add about 2% dried seaweed, specific seaweeds called Asparagopsis paxiformis, to cattle feed, which then reduces cows from burping. So if we can grow that species, we can already help fight climate change. There is incredible potential to expand seaweed farms in Cornwall and further up in the UK as well. One of the problems that Cornwall has is a lot of storms coming from east, west, north or south. Seaweed farms can reduce wave height and thereby coastal erosion. So if there's areas in the UK or in the world that are prone to coastal erosion, it kind of makes sense to use seaweed farms to put in front of them to dampen that impact of the sea. Increased storminess as our climate changes is a problem for many marine animals too. Sue Sayer has dedicated the past 20 years of her life to studying Cornwall's grey seals and she took me out onto the cliffs near where she lives to explain more. Seals in Cornwall are very special because they are at the southernmost range of their species range. In the UK we've got 34% of the world's population but even so there are more red squirrels in the UK than there are grey seals. So this is not a massively numerate population. 2017 was the start of a potential series of years that have been very difficult and challenging for seals during the pupping season. Storm Brian was a storm that occurred in October, start of the pupping season, on a big spring tide of the year at high tide and these massive swells probably washed off every seal pup that was alive on the Sillies at the time, washed them off all their beaches away from their mothers. The following year there was a really interesting impact. We think what happened is lots of mums lost their pups. They had complications like mastitis because they weren't able to get rid of their milk and feed their pups. And they then had hormonal issues, so they didn't mate when they should have mated. So the following year we had something like a 43 to 46% drop in pup numbers, potentially because of the complications of the storms of previous year. It's like if you lose your child and you've got milk, let alone all the emotional stuff, you know, it must be hideous, mustn't it? And I've watched mums come out for 15 days consecutively to try and feed a dead pup that's still on the beach. Their mothering instinct is so strong that if they can smell the pup, they will try and feed it even if it's being scavenged by gulls. Sue estimates a couple of hundred seals are born around the Cornish coast each year, but recently the number of pups needing to be rescued has risen fast, as well as pups and adults washing up dead. Many of these casualties could be due to stormier seas. Clearly seals are very competent in the water, massively agile and fantastically wonderful to look at. In a big storm swell, that is a real challenge. 
It's the biggest challenge for the youngest, smallest, weakest seals, but it's also a challenge for adults. In the last season, particularly after the storms, there were a lot of trauma injuries. Bashed heads, hemorrhages on the brain, broken jaws, cracked ribs, that kind of thing. When animals just lose control and crash against a rock in a big wave. Climate change is also bringing heavier rain, which you might not think would bother a waterproof species. The rain has been coming in extreme events and it saturates the rock and then the rock slides and it slides over a haul out beach and seals get killed underneath the rockfall. We've had that happen on numerous occasions, but much worse than that is when it happens on a pupping cave in the pupping season. One of my favourite seals, I saw her just outside the cave just before the rockfall happened. I went the following week and I just couldn't believe the transformation in the cliff because it looked like a different place. I haven't seen her since, so I'm guessing that she and her pup and numerous other mums and pups would have been in those sea caves and perished. Seals in Cornwall usually give birth between August and December, but Sue thinks that might change. As our winters become stormier, pups born earlier could become more successful. This might solve one problem, but could cause another, especially as Cornwall's tourist industry grows. Most seal pups tend to be born in remoter places. Often on the north coast here, it's on beaches that are inaccessible, which is fine. However, a pup will leave the beach at three weeks, and those are the animals that tend to come into conflict with humans because they'll rock up on a public beach because they're exhausted and just want to sleep. It's a public beach and people just want to have a look. If you shift the cycles of the natural world, that interaction and conflict between us and nature is going to get worse. Silly's over 100 years ago. Pittosporum was brought to the islands primarily by farmers who fence or hedgerow fields to protect the flowers in the flower fields because of the wind that we have around the islands. One of the downsides to the tree is that it has these little pom-poms on. Birds really love the seeds within the pom-poms, so our land birds will eat the seeds, they then disperse all over the islands. We've now got trees on all of our uninhabited islands. Now, when you think about gulls, puffins, manx shearwater, they like wide open spaces where they can see predators, where they feel that they can protect their chicks the best. They like rocky outcrops that they can stand on and they can kind of survey the land beneath them. When you've got pittosporum trees that are popping up everywhere, it blocks the view. It also removes areas of breeding ground. So the ranger team will go out to our uninhabited islands and they will remove pittosporum trees. It's a huge task because they're really fast growing. They self-seed too, so once you've got a tree on an island it just kind of pops seeds everywhere. Their main tasks in the winter is going to our uninhabited islands and trying to keep them how they used to be, so wide open spaces that the birds like. With the severity and frequency of the winter storms, the ranger team can't get to the uninhabited islands as much as they used to be able to because when they go there they go on a dinghy with brush cutters, chainsaws, all of the equipment they need and it's beach landings or rock landings for most of the time and obviously if we've got big ground seas, big swells, they can't land on the islands. Sadly, storms can also damage some of the very marine habitats that we really need to help suck up carbon. I went out kayaking with Fiona Crouch to find out more about her work to protect one of them. Seagrass is amazing. It's known as a wonder plant. Not many people know about it because it's below the waves. It photosynthesizes just like our trees and our plants on land and so it pulls in carbon dioxide and then it releases oxygen. It can store carbon like 35 times more than our rainforest and it can consolidate sediment so it can be good to reduce coastal erosion because it reduces the impact of waves on our shores. It's an amazing nursery ground for lots of different species like commercial species of fish which is really important and other species such as seahorses and stalk jellyfish. It's a brilliant, brilliant plant. But the UK has lost over 90% of its seagrass meadows in the past century. Fiona's now heading up a project that aims to recover seagrass beds in five special areas of conservation around the country and this includes a project to replant four hectares of it here in Plymouth Sound. And it's very much in its trial 
stages at the moment because it's very challenging. It's not like on the land where you can just go and plant out a few seedlings and give them a bit of water and see what happens. Seagrass is a flowering plant and it actually does have seeds, but a tiny percentage of them actually will grow into little seedlings in natural state. So we can collect those from the wild and then those being taken to the aquarium and then they grow the seedlings from seed and then those will be transplanted out into the bay. But just replanting seagrass won't solve the problem on its own. Fiona's team is keen to get to the root of the other problems that are damaging seagrass in the first place. The traditional moorings that we have, they're a big concrete block on the seabed and then there's a chain and then the buoy, like we're bobbing around on here. And those chains actually scours and abrade seagrass around the base of those moorings. If you go onto Google Maps, you see it in ours are silly, you can see the circles around the boats where the seagrass has been scoured. There's several alternatives. The one that we're moored up to here is a sterling mooring. And it's quite a simple system, but basically there's just a number of buoys on that chain that lifts that chain off the seabed. And they have seen that in these areas, the seagrass is growing back up to the base of the mooring. But a big part of the problem is that many sailors just don't know what's beneath them. I came out here last May bank holiday to talk to some of the people anchoring, let them know that actually there's a seagrass bed below there, it's a sensitive habitat, it's protected. A lot of them said, oh, really sorry, we didn't know it was there. And I'd like to think once people do know where there is, they'd like to take action to avoid anchoring within seagrass beds. Another serious threat to seagrass is runoff of topsoil and slurry from farmland, which will happen more often as winter rains become more intense. Seagrass needs light to grow. If you get a mass deluge of red, muddy water coming down into the sea, then that's going to increase the sediment, which can have a smothering effect. They're quite resilient, marine species, but if we just keep piling on the stress in all different areas, they're going to struggle and we need to give them some help because they are so important. And ironically, our efforts to fight climate change could actually create another source of stress for marine habitats. The government wants all our homes to be powered by offshore wind by 2030, and this is going to mean huge amounts of underwater construction, pipelines and cables, but these things are usually encased in concrete to protect them and concrete production itself actually releases huge amounts of carbon. Now one local company has come up with an ingenious low-impact alternative involving this pile of Cornish China clay waste and what looks like a heap of old washing machines. As divers we'd seen the damage done to rocky reef habitats and limestone habitats through bottom trawling. You'll come across these trawl marks and absolute devastation in the seabed. And unfortunately, rock doesn't regrow. So we thought, let's come up with a way to recreate these rocky reef habitats and to provide sustainable homes for a marine life. So they're made from a Portland-free concrete mix with recycled materials. It's 80% less carbon to produce our cubes. We need artificial reefs because there's a massive decline in our commercial fish stocks and, and marine species in a whole worldwide. Primarily that's because of man's interaction with the ocean and whether it's building offshore wind farms, oil and gas platforms or trawling for shellfish, we've caused a lot of damage and we need to act now to put something back and give the species somewhere they can grow up. They look very grey initially. Once they're deployed, after about three months, you'll have a very thick biofilm already adhering and covering the cubes. So a green browny colour, and that is the start of the reef build. And from that, you'll get barnacles, you'll get tube worms, you'll get kelps, we'll get seaweeds. We'll all adhere and start growing from the cubes. James hopes they could also be used to help restore fragile habitats around the world that are already being affected by climate change. The company's trying to propagate coral onto the cubes and also trying to grow mangrove seedlings in them, which could help to build up coastal defences in low-lying tropical countries. But as sea levels rise and storms increase, they could help Cornwall too. Cornwall's got a very, very long coastline with lots of open areas to the sea and coastal erosion. And if we can protect the coastline from the damage and from the storms and provide marine habitat for organisms, then it's a win-win.
A current production is probably 200 to 250 different size cubes per day, but we're hoping to upscale our manufacturing on a much larger scale with batching plants and other machinery. We could be producing maybe two to 3,000 cubes a day, and we need to do that to actually have an impact. Ultimate goal for 20 years time, I'd like to see reef cubes, or if not reef cubes, nature inclusive design used for all offshore construction. We've got the technology, we've got the know-how, and we shouldn't be building stuff in the sea if it's not going to benefit the sea life as well. I've been lucky enough to meet some of Cornwall's top marine experts while I've been making this film, and the message from all of them has been clear. Climate change is going to bring huge challenges, but there will be opportunities too. And in fact, with so much sea surrounding us, Cornwall could really pave the way in protecting the marine ecosystems that are going to be critical to protecting us in future. It's still not too late as long as we all get on board now and do our part to protect the sea, because it controls our climate and supports such a vast array of life. And that life includes us. Wow. <laughs> so I think you'll agree that was an absolutely fantastic and fascinating film. It, it really does make you think and shines a light on some of the most challenging and interesting issues that around Cornwall and its uh, climate change. Um, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to another trustee, Alex, who, who's going to be running the Q&A for the next 15 minutes. Um, as I said, we're probably going to aim to finish at around about 9 uh, PM. But if it's lively, we'll go for another 10 minutes. So still keep putting your questions into the chat. And um, before I hand over to Alex, I'll just introduce you to some of the experts. We've got an amazing team of experts on the call tonight who will be able to hopefully answer all of your questions. We've got uh, Dr. Matthew Witt from the University of Exeter, Fiona Crouch from Natural England, Mar Marianne Wooten from the Marine Biological Association, Mark Grantham, Cornwall Birds, Ruth Williams, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, Sue Sayer from the Cornwall Seal uh, Group Research Trust, you saw, Nikki Banfield from the Isles of Scilly Wildlife Trust, uh, James Dodrell, Arc Marine, and last but not least, Councillor Edwina Hannaford, the Cornwall Council Portfolio Holder for Climate Change and Neighbourhoods. So, um, so it's a fantastic panel, so please do add your questions into the chat box. Um, while you're thinking about your questions, I'm going to start by asking uh, Claire Bryony and Councillor Hannaford a couple of questions to just kick things off. So first of all, Claire, you're best known for your campaigning work against plastic in the ocean. So why did you decide to set up Cornwall Climate Care and focus on the broader questions? Thanks, Dawn. Um, well, Obviously, I am very, very passionate about plastic pollution. And first of all, I just want to say, you know, of course, I'm not saying that plastic isn't very, very important. As I'm sure everybody knows, it kills hundreds of thousands of marine animals every year from plankton right up to whales. Um, and it is made of fossil fuels, of course. So it is part of the climate problem. And plastic pollution, it's, uh, uh, plastic production, I think, is set to triple in the next 10 years. So it is, it is really major. 
people focus on it a lot, I think, because it's so visible and you can see what the impact is. Um, and it's right here on our beaches in Cornwall. It's not some sort of um, amorphous thing on the other side of the world. <clears throat> but I suppose um, over the years, going to conferences, I talked to a lot of, um, of, of marine scientists and experts. And it started to make me think, you know, even if we completely could clear up all the plastic in the ocean, that wouldn't solve the problem because the, the 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 climate crisis would still be there and actually every single aspect of life in the ocean is affected by climate change um i read an incredible statistic recently i think probably lots of people have heard that um the ocean has absorbed 90 percent of the additional heat that we've created since the beginning of the industrial revolution but that doesn't mean much to most people apparently that is the same as that's equivalent to 1.5 hiroshima atom bombs going off every second in the ocean for the past 150 years so it's it's absolutely huge um and the effects go right through every single process and species in the ocean we're humans we live on dry land so we're very focused on what happens here um, but as as ruth told me you know nearly all conservation work is focused on the land too and this is a sort of crazy dichotomy because, of course, most of our ocean is planet. So uh, we really do ignore it at our peril. Um, the ocean regulates the whole of our planet's climate and weather systems. So whatever happens to the ocean is going to affect us too. And I think it's just time that we stop only thinking about plastic and think about this bigger picture. OK, thanks, Claire. Um, I'm now going to um, bring Bryony in. Um, Bryony, you've clearly met some incredible people during these film, this film, absolute experts. What's been the most striking thing about the environmental challenge in Cornwall for you? Um, I think that we were really overwhelmed by the amount of positive responses um, to the climate challenge that we found. People just getting on and doing it um, instead of sort of wasting their energy shouting they're picking up the tools and and just mending um i just i, I honestly didn't realize how many different pockets of things are happening all over cornwall um obviously not just in this film that we've seen tonight but we've started interviewing people in uh, across the board and there's some brilliant stuff going on i think um the, the the clearest thing is that it's not a debate over whether or not it is a problem anymore in Cornwall. We know it's a problem because we live in Cornwall. So that's why I think people are motivated to actually act on it. Thanks, Bryony. Um, Councillor Hannaford, um, a few people are already mentioning in the, in the chat box about the role of Cornwall Council. I wondered if you could tell me the top two things that Cornwall Council is focused on in the months ahead to tackle climate change. OK, thank you so much. And what an inspirational film. Uh, it's fantastic. I've learned a lot. So I think the uh, first thing I say is try to practice what we preach. I say try because we don't always get that right. So what I'm trying to do is to embed the climate and ecological actions into all we do. For example, most of our officers are working from home currently, um, saving a staggering 80,000 commuting miles a day. Um, we're changing our fleet cars to be electric, we're fitting EV charging points, and we're harnessing methane from our Cornwall Farms portfolio to make biomethane. Um, all the council's energy consumption now comes from renewable sources. So COVID has um, accelerated this, but we are reorganising the way we work on new ways of home and local working as we try to decentralise as well as decarbonise. So we're shaping our investments, our projects, decisions, even our budget this year uh, and policies towards being net carbon neutral by 2030. And we've been using a groundbreaking donut economics decision making wheel to try and balance that people and planet and ensure the social justice within all we do. So we are investing in whole house retrofitting, uh, planting of forest, investing in onshore and offshore floating off wi offshore uh, wind turbines and introducing curbside food waste collection that will be anaerobically digested, digested. So our focus is on terrestrial actions as this is where our powers lie. But having seen this film, I think we really re need to retune our focus um, on our marine environment, its protection, its enhancement, and the opportunities. And the second thing, and I've seen some of these questions um, within the chat there, I think it's influencing national policy. We can't do this on our own. Cornwall Council can do a degree of stuff, 
Um, but we really need government to step up. Um, so we are influencing and lobbying government to provide the resources and powers to allow us, uh, not just the council, but local people to take action. And that's the basis of the original climate emergency motion. Uh, we do all this by agreeing our asks of government, for example, improving our electrical grid infrastructure and changes to the planning system. And we do that by engaging with our MPs and we have an MPs meeting uh, tomorrow. But we also work nationally and collaboratively with other local authorities through the Climate uh, Resilience Task Force, uh, which is building that ask towards COP26, uh, climate side, uh, countryside climate alliance through UK uh, 100. We've got a lot more to do and there are anomalies, hold hands up, but the intent is there. We really want to embed the climate and the ecological emergency into all we do. Thank you. Thanks, Edwina. That was, that was great. It's a huge subject, undoubtedly, with some huge challenges, but it is very interesting to see and hear what's actually happening. Um, lots of things that many people, I think, on this, on this call have not heard about. So, Alex, would you like to um, pose some of the questions to our panel, please? Great. Thanks, Dawn. Um, it's been hard work keeping track of all these comments. They're still coming in like ticker tape. Um, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions, but we'll, we'll give it a good go. Um, we've had some fantastic comments on the closure of the film. Um, I learned so much. I, a thought-provoking and inspirational, sad and scary. We've had more excitement about seaweed than I've ever seen and quite a lot of sadness about seals as well. So all a bit sad. Um, but uh, I'll start off with the first question. I think I'll go to Matt for this one. Sorry, Matt. Um, but there was kind of a question um, about the potential impact of renewable energy, offshore renewable energy on our seas. And do we actually see much impact from Cornish fishing in our Cornish seas? Oh, um, uh, fishing impacts on renewables, do you mean? Well, no, the impact of fisheries on kind of marine ecosystems, the impact of renewables on marine ecosystems and things. Oh, are wind time, are winter, floating offshore wind turbines a good thing? Oh, yes. OK, so um, I, I've been working at the Wake Up site for um, um, like the last decade, since 2008, trying to understand those types of responses. And actually, Wake Hub hasn't really seen um, large scale development as yet. But there's, I think we can take some knowledge from the North Sea that there are positives and negatives to the installation of large wind farms. It can systematically change the seabed, but often you're putting these wind farms in areas of seabed that have already been modified. Um, so, yes, you can create new habitat, and those areas around wind turbines can become de facto protected areas to some extent. Um, not all activities are excluded. So uh, it's challenging with wind farms. We, we do need to create energy in an alternative way that isn't fossil based. But the um, life cycle development of wind farms is really challenging in terms of its carbon footprint. But they do offer us a, a solution in terms of uh, greener energy. And I think they can be built um, sustainably in the marine environment to benefit both the production of low carbon energy, but also to improve ecosystems in which those farms are placed. Great. Thanks, Maz. Thanks, Matt. Um, a question for Maz now. Um, this came from Karen Lawrence, but she kind of posed the question, if we did nothing, if we take no action now, you know, what would our seas look like off the coast of Cornwall in 50 or 100 years? You know, would we be wading into a soup of uh, jellyfish or would it take the skin from our feet or what would it look like? Oh my goodness, what a question. Um, <laughs> I think every scientist would like to know the answer to that. We don't have crystal balls, unfortunately, uh, but that's why we monitor. So uh, the, where I work, we've got a long-term time series and uh, it's only by using that time series we can look for patterns. And that's what helps us to make some predictions, I guess, um, what we're seeing, as I said in, in, in the movie, was that we're seeing um, the warmer species moving in around the UK and the colder water species retreating further north. Um, who knows eventually what impact that will have, but we've certainly seen impacts on fisheries already. 
Um, now we're starting to see perhaps a change in size of species. So the warmer water species tend to be smaller, smaller in size. That then, of course, has impacts further up the food chain. So it means that food that is available, not only is it perhaps not as numerous, it's not as big in size. So you could perhaps expect there to be some fisheries impacts, definitely. In certain areas, we've seen um, increases in crustaceans, so crabs. So perhaps our fisheries may, may indeed change one day from, from pelagic fish to, to crabs. Uh, they might be become more numerous, maybe. Yes, and you're right, jellyfish, um, certain, so as you remove the top predator, which is usually fish, um, something usually comes in to replace that. And we've seen in some other areas an increase in jellyfish too. So uh, I can't give a definitive answer of what will happen, just that, just know that there, there's people out there looking, monitoring, and, and trying to look for signs. Great. Great. Thanks, Max. Um, a question for, I think, uh, Ruth now. And so this was kind of provoked by a, a, a comment from Steve Underwood, who says the film should be rolled out to all the schools in Cornwall. So perhaps Edwina is listening to that. Um, uh, but linked to that, John Faulkner, who's a primary school teacher, said, you know, what local organisations are out there that can come and help and support primary schools in thinking about climate change and, and environmental sustainability? Um, all sorts. <laughs> there's there's um, a lot of, of um, NGOs and charitable and voluntary organisations who are doing a lot in, in terms of getting the message out and education. I think Claire said at the beginning of the, the film that um, one key aim of, of this series of films is to get that message out. And, and I think they will be going into schools and working with schools um, to show this film. Um, in terms of educational resources, there's there's all sorts out there. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of educational packs. The Wildlife Trust produce um, various sorts on various subjects. Um, there's... there's um, wildlife watch groups and all sorts of things surface against sewage do an awful lot of educational work and then right down to the voluntary groups so we've got the Cornwall Plastic Pollution Coalition who are a, a coalition of, of voluntary um, groups around the county who um, who raise awareness of, of the plastics issue and, and go into schools and, and help to, to promote that sort of thing and the the marine the marine community hubs, the marine community groups are the ones that are going to be spilling out this message. And I, I think if anybody is, is interested, you know, just just look at your, your local community. And generally, there's there'll be a um, marine community group somewhere nearby and a link there will, will be um, to, to help to, um, to to get in touch with them and, and get those those resources and what those those people are doing on the ground in your local community. And I think that's a, a good way to start. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in around energy and um, such like. It was just to say that this is our first film in a series of films. Brian is going to be hard hard at work getting out there with our camera in the next year with Claire. And um, we're going to have other films looking at food, looking at energy and things. So I'm going to steer questions a little bit more back to our maritime environment. Um, so a question for James. Um, someone asked um, about the artificial reefs and kind of what is the real opportunity for really scaling this up across the UK and beyond? Or is this, a, you know, a much more niche kind of product that is only going to work in certain areas? Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, no, I think um, Reef Cubes is a, is a product that can be used worldwide, um, whether there's offshore infrastructure or coastal infrastructure um, being built. Um, reef Cubes, we've proven Reef Cubes to work for scour protection um, and to help protect those assets uh, that are built in the, in the sea. Um, and the, the benefit with the Reef Cubes is that although their companies are receiving protection for their infrastructure, um, they're also act, acting as a shelter habitat um, and a substrate for, for marine life to grow on. Um, 
Thank you very much. We're just at nine o'clock. I think because we've got loads of other questions, Alex, by the sounds of it, we might give it another 10 minutes. So we'll have a, a hard stop at 10 past nine, but there's still time for a few more questions. So if you want to pitch a few to our panel. Great. Uh, so I think a question for Sue, I think now. Um, so you might have heard that G7 is taking place in Cornwall in uh, June. And um, if you were just strolling down the high street of St Ives and you just ha happened to bump into President Modi and President Biden, what would you say to them? Well, that's a very good question. I would say to them that we as a human race really need to be more adaptable. Um, uh, grey seals have survived in a very, very changing marine environment through their adaptability. One of our strengths as a human species is our ability to adapt, but we now need to adapt very quickly. We need to read and hear the messages that not only the marine environment, but the terrestrial environment, air, land and sea are all giving us. Um, and you need to start taking some steps and making sure that our adaptability happens in the way that it needs to do in order to reduce our impacts on climate so that we have a planet for the future. Um, this is about looking after ourselves as well as everything else. So we need to get on and do it. Great, thanks Sue. Um, so uh, perhaps a question for Edwina now. Um, inevitably, there's been a few dismayed comments about how politicians, both mm -hmm. the big ones, the MPs and, and the local ones, everyone spoke very highly of you though, Edwina. So I think you're off the hook. So mm -hmm. and it's election year as well. So that's all good news. <laughs> um, but what can residents do in Cornwall to um, support the pace at which Cornwall Council can move? So not more not 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 asking what more should Cornwall Council do, but how can residents help Cornwall Council? Um, well, I think we need to be clear that Cornwall Council can't do everything. This is all of our responsibility. Um, we all have to work together towards that common goal. So the role of Cornwall Council, yes, we need to get our own house in order, um, but I think we need to help to facilitate others and provide the tools. Uh, we're providing some funding through Crowdfunder um, for communities to be able to plant trees um, or to figure out their action plans. Um, there's also, I'd like to give a bit of publicity to, um, I did notice one of the questions was about um, where can we get more information? So we've got a, a platform that's called um, Let's Talk Cornwall. Um, I'll post the, um, the web link into the chat bar there. So there's all information about our nature recovery plans. We're one of only one pilot pilots in front, five in the whole country to try and um, rebuild nature. Uh, making space for nature and a really good place is the carbon neutral Cornwall Hive. There is an ideas bank on there. Uh, there's lots of resources. Um, you can write a blog. We could post this film on there, which I'd really like to do. Um, so rather than um, giving a quick answer, I want to perhaps um, point you in a direction of where you can find out uh, more information. The actual climate emergency development plan document, the planning document, um, is out for consultation at the moment. So you can make comment on that as well. So there's lots of results. We can always do more, but we really have to do this uh, collectively. So we're trying to join all the dots. So there is um, a schools forum um, that we're working with. There's um, the main emitting sectors in Cornwall, whether that's from public transport or housing. We, we've got partnerships there that we're trying. And there's grassroots as well. I mean, I'm activists in my in my own area trying to do things. So we're trying to support town and parish councils to take action. So if I signpost you to the Let's Talk, then uh, rather than taking up too much of your time, um, you can find out more there. And I'm available anyway after the meeting if you'd like to find out more. Great, thanks Edwina. Um, so a, a question for the two um, Oscar nominees of the night, Bryony and Claire, I suppose. Um, they've done all the hard work, so what I kind of, um, folk have asked, why do it this year? You know, there's been, there's been a pandemic on, the kind of world's collapsed. Um, whose idea was it that we that you should have wandered around with a camera when no one wanted to speak to you or it was impossible to speak to them. Why this year? 
do you want to say something, Brian? Or should I, well, I'll just say something very quickly and then hand over to Bryony. Um, well, we, we did sort of have a momentary wobble and think, you know, maybe this isn't the right time because obviously everyone's very um, um, a, a affected by COVID at the moment. But then, you know, we thought, no, we are in a climate emergency. This can't wait. And, uh, and, and we found that people were very, very keen to speak to us. So um, it, it had its challenges. Um, probably Bryony can talk about that better than, than I could. But we, we just felt like there's so much material and there's so many stories to tell. And we really wanted to start now. Um, and uh, it has been difficult, but we're really glad that we could do this. Um, what, what do you think, Bryony? Well, we were actually due to start in March 2020, so um, we did delay things a little bit. We did wait until we were supposed to, um, and I got an email with some independent filmmakers' um, guidelines of what, of when to go back, you know, whether or not to start filming in between lockdowns, and it asked the question, is your film important enough? Do people need to know about this film right now? And yes, they do. They need to know what's going on right now. They needed to know what was going on, you know, we're 10 years ago. So we felt that the time was now and that we really needed to get out there and start filming things. Um, we also, uh, we had all sorts of um, risk assessments and health and safety extra rules, which our panellists here will all remember. I had my little gloves and bags with, with radio mics and all that sort of stuff. So we made sure that we weren't taking putting anybody in danger um, and I sort of came into my own in terms of I um, have worked as a videographer for, for quite a few years so I can film and record the sound um, which obviously it would be better quality if I didn't but all of a sudden it meant that I could get out there and film without um, you know suddenly having five people and we filmed everything outside um, yes I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you both so uh, a final kind of large question for, for Mark and Fiona and then Nikki, because I've not, not posed a question to them, but do you think Cornwall is special in the fight against climate change or are we just another county doing the best of what we can? Are we special or are we just like everyone else? So Mark first, then uh, Fiona and then Nikki, just a quick, quick response. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I think our our geography puts us kind of at the uh, at the pointy end of the of the wedge. Effectively, that that issues that will slowly kind of creep up the country are are issues that we're going to um, see in Cornwall first. So what what we're seeing in the southern edge of the range of of a lot of the species that we're interested in, these are the issues that will slowly creep up the country. Um, so the fact that Cornwall, within a UK context, the fact that Cornwall will see those issues first, yeah, it puts us really at the cutting edge for, for you know, we can almost set the standard of, of the monitoring and of, of, the, of the kind of actions that need to be taken that can then be followed as, as those issues creep forever sort of further north. Obviously, there's a limit to how far north these issues can go. Uh, you know, eventually we just run out of space uh, as species are pushed north. But yeah, where, where we are gives us that that kind of, yeah, we, we are the first by the cherry to solve some of the problems. Oh, one for me. Okay, I don't expect this. Um, no, I think Cornwall is in a very good place. I think uh, it has a beautiful environment. Um, we've seen that um, with the work, you know, kind of we're doing with remedies uh, around our sensitive habitats. Um, you know, we get amazing support from the communities. And I think what um, really benefits what we can do in Cornwall is we have some amazing marine institutes on our doorstep. I mean, we heard from Maz at the Marine Biological Association. Okay, it's over the other side of the Tamar, so it's theoretically in Devon, but uh, still be working in Cornwall. And then we have all, all the work in um, Exeter, down at Exeter University, down in Falmouth. So, I think we're really placed, well placed uh, with Cornwall with the expertise we have um, in the area, the amazing environment we have. And I think um, the community and, and people around Cornwall are, um, you know, I think that a, a lot of their attitude is very um, supportive and want to um, help and, and are very aware of um, the challenges we face um, and, and how we can hopefully and be an example and and when it comes to climate change and what we can do um, in this beautiful 
had I, I live in Plymouth, sorry, I'm over the other side, but I I, I love the single, so I think it's in a great place to support that. And Nikki, Nikki, our um, our Western correspondent on the Isles of Scilly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to reiterate what everyone else has said, and um, we really are on the pointy end here in Scilly. Um, and as I said in the in the film, we've we've literally sort of our winters have become immense. Our winters start in autumn. We have the storms. Everything goes on through, and I think it's because of where we live, not just Scilly, but also in Cornwall. We are part of the natural world, probably more than anywhere else in the country. Um, and I think we are in the best position to be able to get people interested in this. And if we can't do it, then nobody's going to do it because actually Cornwall and Scilly are so important to so many people, particularly sort of visiting communities that come in. Um, yeah, so hopefully people watching this will want to help us save Scilly, particularly because we're going to be the first that go under. Um, and then obviously Cornwall as well, because actually it's a great part of the country and people love it here. So, yeah, everybody can do their bit, definitely. Thanks, Nikki. OK, so it's uh, ten past nine. I think we could talk all night about this. It's such a huge uh, subject and just so many interesting things to say. But if you keep tuned in, uh, you're going to see an amazing series of films that will uh, tackle more and more of these questions and share what's really going on. So, so please do follow the story. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, and I just wanted to say a massive, huge thank you to Claire and Bryony for this amazing film. Um, I think they deserve a big clap, a big online clap and cheer. <laughs> Uh, for all their work it's a truly amazing film very thought-provoking and I'm really looking forward to seeing the next one and the next ones in the future um, but thank you to all of you as well for joining us tonight I know you probably had another hundred zoom webinars you were supposed to join or family things going on but thank you very very much for joining us and watching and sharing your questions it's been really really interesting we ha really hope you enjoyed the film um, please do share it. This film is for everybody. We want everyone to see it. Um, we want everyone to think about some of the issues it raises. The film is available now on our website, so you can hop onto our website and have a look. It's also available on YouTube. Um, on the website, there's actually lots more information about the film, plus full audio interviews with the participants. So there's more unseen footage that you can enjoy at your leisure. Um, as Alex mentioned in the chat um, a couple of minutes ago, um, BBC Spotlight has been uh, in touch and they're going to be featuring the film tomorrow. So they'd really like to talk to some of you about what you thought about the film. So if you're interested in getting your, um, your, yourself on the telly, um, please do get in touch and we'll put you forward for some interviews. Um, we've also got a um, Facebook page running and Twitter. The links should be appearing in the chat box if they're not there already. Um, and if you've enjoyed this film um, and you support our aims, do try to get these films out as widely as possible and talk about them. Um, we love your ideas around education. If you've got any ideas around that, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and also please donate to help us um, fund some next, next ones. Uh, and there's a little donate button on the website. So check that out. Anyway, finally, thank you very much again to Claire and Bryony. It's been an amazing uh, hour and a half. And um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed everything. And I really hope you'll stay in touch with us and follow our story. Good night.